So in this video, I want to have a look at some of the tools that are already developed to help you work with the system, in particular tools to help you name sound effects in accordance with our category ID and file name structure. So I want to show you a couple of options that exist right now. There's a lot of tools being developed. Certainly more are coming for Reaper, for other programs. We're talking with other vendors and programmers of database software to incorporate this system somehow into their programs. And so we know that in the future, there'll be a lot of exciting sort of new ways to incorporate this system. So stay tuned to our channel here. The best thing is probably to subscribe. We'll be posting new videos as new tools are released. But I wanted to show you two of them today that exist right now that are available to download from the Google Drive home folder. Um, there'll be updates to these over time, so you'll want to check back occasionally and see if something has been updated or changed. But one of them is a standalone app that we have available, and the other one is a keyboard maestro sort of macro group, which is available for Pro Tools. So I want to show you those. So this first program I want to show you is called Audio Category Clipper. It was written by Kai Paquin's father, and Kai was very much involved in the writing of this piece of software. And it's a standalone app. It's written on the Google Chrome Developer Kit. It's currently being ported also to PC, and I believe it's an open source project, and all of the code is available on GitHub. So somebody could take this work and port it to something else or expand on it if they wanted to. It has two sort of tabs, a category and a file name. We'll look first at the category. And what it allows you to do is to pull up the list, basically, the embedded list of our categories and subcategories and cat IDs. And you can also search. So if I type dog, it suggests to me that there's a category called animals dog. And there's the cat ID animal dog. And when I click this, basically, you can see down here that animal dog and the cat ID were all copied to the clipboard. And they were all copied to the clipboard because I have all three checked here. If I were to uncheck this, let's say I was only interested in having it copy basically this chunk, animal dog, which is the cat ID to the clipboard, then I could just come back here, search again. When I select it, it's now selected just animal dog to the clipboard. So I could take this now, move over to a file name and paste this at the head of a file name or a series of file names, I suppose. So this program in its simplest form is simply a way to look up what are the cat IDs, categories and subcategories that are in the list. But one of the really cool things that it also has the ability to do is search our synonyms column. So this is the only tool right now that makes use of the synonyms. But now when I come over here and I type the word lion, it recommends to me two potential categories because that word lion appears in the synonym list twice under animals aquatic because sea lion is listed there as a synonym and under animals wildcats. So, so I could simply choose this category now and again, animal wildcat was copied to the clipboard. If I came in here to type sail, it recommends to me sailboat and cloth flap because sailcloth is listed as a cloth flap synonym. So you get the idea of the power of the synonyms here. If I search the term tennis, I get two potential results, again, searching the synonyms. I get sports court, which tells me which sports category tennis would be assigned. And I get ambience sport because tennis is also listed there. In this case, ambience sport would be an ambient of a tennis match, not necessarily the playing of tennis alone, but also mixed with crowds, announcers, and things like that. That's, again, the definition of an ambience for us is sort of a more complex ambience that's not a single element. And for example, if I type waterfall, I'm told that there's a category water waterfall, which is exactly where I would want that sound to go. So the power of the synonyms is pretty clear to see here, uh, especially if somebody who doesn't know the category system very well and you're just learning it. This tool, if nothing else, really helps you define where to put a sound. And as the synonyms column keeps growing and growing, this tool will become even more and more useful. So I want to look at the second pane of this program, the second tab, and this is a file name builder. So it's similar to the category lookup, but this one is a little more powerful. Again, it has the same component to search for a category. So if I were to type football, and again, I get field sports or ambient sport, I'm gonna choose field sport. And over here is where I can define an optional user category. Now in the previous video on file name structure, we talked about the ability to define a user category. So if I wanted to define a user category, I could do that here. I could put ext for exterior. And the nice thing about this program is that it's showing you the file name being built in real time. So you can kind of see how these components are being put together. So sport field dash ext is now defined. The effects name as well. Um, I could put like here big football impacts. 
something like that. Or in this case, I would probably want to title case it. And the reason I want to do that is that some users down the line may choose to remove the spaces from the file name. And if everything was lowercase, the minute that they did that, all of these words would run together and make separating the words quite difficult later for any scripts or tools that you might want to use. So we recommend definitely title casing each of the words in the effects name chunk. Some of the tools will actually do this for you automatically. Uh, this one doesn't, so you have to be careful to do this. You could also, again, if you are a user that chose not to use spaces in your file name, simply remove them. But so now we've extended the file name out through the effects name. This tool at the moment doesn't assign vendor categories. It might be updated at some point to offer that as a possibility. But this tool doesn't use that right now. These next two fields are red. And they're red because they will basically be persistently stored between a relaunch of the program. So again, since I'm likely to be putting in mostly my own sounds, and for example, I might be working constantly on a project, TLP is the abbreviation for the little prince, um, I wouldn't want to have to enter these every single time. It might be that at some point we develop this tool into have a set of drop downs for different initials. So a librarian who is constantly putting in different people's sound files may have access to a drop down or a list of shows. But at least right now, it will remember these when you quit and relaunch the program. And again, lastly, this optional user data field could be typed here if you wanted to. So I could type here MKH416, which is a type of microphone. The second that I hit enter, that entire name is now copied to the clipboard. I can also come over here and actually just manually copy to the clipboard by pushing this blue icon. And now that that name is in the clipboard, I could do various things with it. I could switch to another program and paste it in or things like that. It is possible to run an Apple script directly from this program. And at some point we'll do an example of that. It's a little bit sluggish because of the nature of the way the Chrome Toolkit works. There's a long lag. And so what instead we've decided to do is to build some keyboard maestro macros that will basically take this file name that we've just copied to the clipboard, switch back to Pro Tools and paste the name. And you'll see that it has just a simple name of record01. Well, if I press the hotkey that I've associated with Keyboard Maestro, in my case it's Command F16, what you'll see is that it'll switch to Pro Tools and it'll paste that file name directly in. And so you can see here that it took this exact file name because we had copied it to the clipboard, it switched to Pro Tools, and it pasted this in. This is a fully official sort of file name within the system, and fairly easily we were able to build it here. You could come back here if you were making a modification to it, to a, another one, or, you know, you decided you wanted to change a word, you could just simply do that. I can now simply rerun that macro. It'll come back here and it'll update the name just like that. So this is a fairly easy way in Pro Tools to sort of name your files in accordance with our system is by using this program called Audio Category Clipper. This tool is available to download on the Google Drive Home folder and the Utilities folder. Um, there'll be some tutorial videos there. If they're not there already, I think they are actually already there. This program also has the ability to actually load in your own category files. So if for some reason you had a separate category file that you wanted to use, it's still possible to use with this program. But the official UCS list is basically pre-built into this program. So I want to show you one more tool set that's been developed. This is a macro group for Keyboard Maestro, which is a Mac program uh, that allows you to do quite complicated macro maneuvers. And this is similar to the audio category clipper program, but it runs natively into Keyboard Maestro. So it accomplishes very much the same thing, but it doesn't require a sort of running program. So in this case, if I want to run it, I simply come to Pro Tools. I have a file name here that, again, has no real name. It's just a recorded file exactly as it was recorded. And if I double-click the naming box to just get it open and then launch the Keyboard Maestro group, in my case by keystroke F16, what you'll see is you're getting a message that says the name dialog box must be open and selected in Pro Tools, sort of a warning. It'll disappear. Later, I'll show you how you can disable that so you don't see it every single time, but until you get used to it, it's a good reminder. And here I'm presented again with a category, subcategory dropdown. And so if I type the word cat, I get basically any category that has cat in it. Now you see this one isn't quite as intelligent in ways it's sort of calling out communications because the word cat actually appears in that as well. But it also does at the top of the list show me animals cat wild and animals cat domestic. So if I wanted to type wild, I would see cat wild or wild animal. So let's choose wild animal. So I hit return and now it asked me if I want to assign a user category. So again, I could put EXT if I wanted to, 
or I can simply leave this blank and either return or escape will basically just skip this step. So I'm just gonna hit return to basically not assign a user category. This version, which is one that I've sort of written and I'll update this as well, also prompts you for the optional vendor category. The tool as it's uploaded right now doesn't do this. It won't ask you for the vendor category, but this is a version that I was experimenting with and we'll make this one available too. I'm gonna to define in this case a uh, vendor category of elephant. So I decided I'm gonna sell a library of wild animal sounds and this one is basically gonna be an elephant. So I'm gonna put vendor category elephant. Now when I hit enter, it's gonna prompt me for the effects name. So I'm gonna type all in lowercase just to show you what this tool set does, but close elephant roars, okay? And when I hit enter, it's gonna ask me now for the recordist field. They're using the term recordist in this tool. Again, we've called it creator ID, but it means the same thing, you know, who designed the sound. In this case, I can start typing my name and in the macro group itself is basically a lookup table and I'll show you how that works, but I can store my name directly into the macro. I can also come down here and type Kai's name who wrote this macro set. He's also stored in this, as a, just so you have a couple of examples. I can also type custom if the name that I want isn't actually in the lookup table yet and I don't wanna have to cancel out and go there and add it, I can simply type custom and now when I hit enter, it's gonna just prompt me. So in this case, I'll just type my initials again just to show you an example, but you could type anything you wanted here. And again, we come to the same thing. The next one is asking us for the show basically and or the library or the project. And again, I'm gonna type the little prints to see that that's actually set in this list as well. And when I hit return, it's gonna add that to my file name. So it's building all of this behind the scenes. So again, now it's asking, do I have any additional information to add? This is the user data chunk that we talked about in the file name structure. So anything else I wanna to add to the end of the file. At this point, I'm gonna put a microphone, the Sankin CO100K. And when I hit return, what you'll see is that basically it's gonna very quickly build this complex file name and paste it into the box and hit return. So again, I now have a fully sort of sanctioned UCS file name that stores all of the pieces that I want. It's defined the category ID, the vendor category of elephant, the rest of the effects name block as close elephant roars, my initials, the initials of the show, TLP, and the microphone sank in C100K. So let's have a look at how this actually works behind the scenes and what parts of it that you can modify or you might choose to modify. So if I come here to Keyboard Maestro, this is how the program looks. And you'll see that this macro group is a fairly complex macro group, but I have access to basically break it down into the various parts and see what it's doing. So if you're not familiar with Keyboard Maestro, there's a little bit of a learning curve. You'll have to spend a little time, but it enables me to assign a hotkey to this action. So again, I mentioned F16 was the key that triggered this action to get it started. There are some comments here that you can read, which are sort of little helpful things to explain what this is doing. Again, here's this block that right at the beginning displays this text that the dialog naming box must be open. If you didn't want to see this every time, you could simply right click this and say disable this action. So from now on, it won't give you this warning anymore. It won't keep displaying this huge text across your screen. What you can do is you can see that in the assigned category and subcategory, there are some instructions that sort of explain what it's doing. And here's where you can see the actual category table that has the category the subcategory and the category ID. Now these are tab delineated, so they look a little strange in this list, but basically they're all broken apart by a single tab and that's the rule here. So if you have two tabs, it might break it. If you don't have a tab, it's gonna get confused and run these things together. So you could down the line simply remove all of these and repaste in a new copy of these three columns, category, subcategory, cat ID. But again, we'll be updating this tool as well. So you could simply download a new set if you want. So again, this is where these things are defined. So when you type the category, it basically knows to add this category ID to the head of the file. These two blocks here ask and prompt for the user category and the vendor category. They add them to variables behind the scenes so that they can be built into the file name later. This block asks prompts for the effects name, which again is stored into a variable to be added into the file name. Here under assign recordist, again, what you'll find is a table. And in this table, you can see that here are the names that are currently stored in the table. I could also rename this if I wanted to creator ID, which is the actual name that we're using in the file name. And maybe we'll change that anyway to avoid confusion. But here you can specify what is the default search term. So this is basically the same as what you would type in that box is automatically typed for you. So that's why custom recordist showed up when I moved to that block. So if I left that empty, then the box will basically prompt me to type something. It won't come up with any default search term. So I'll just leave that blank and then we'll show you what that looks like in the change. 
And again, show is the exact same way. There's a table with a name of your shows, a single tab, and then the initials that you want to use in the actual file name. So I search for the little prints, but the file name actually assigned to TLP into the file name instead of the full words. When we look later at SoundMiner, we'll see SoundMiner will do the reverse. It'll find the initials TLP. It'll do a reverse lookup to this and enter the little prints as the show. Again, there's a default search term. I'm going to just take this out just to show you what it looks like without assigning anything. And again, if we wanted to, we could change the name of this to source ID instead of show. Because in theory, source ID is sort of the proper name that we're calling this in our, in our lookup. Again, we might change the names of these to be to match more of the file name structure now that we've sort of defined the actual terms that we want to use. This tool was written quite early on sort of to see how it all worked together. So uh, don't be surprised if, if you download it, these names have slightly changed, but the blocks of information are still the same. It's the category ID, the effects name, the creator ID, and the source ID. So I'm going to just change this to source ID here. Uh, ignore the rest of the names. It'll still work the same. And lastly, the user data is simply the place that prompts us for what we want to type in. And I could come in here and I could change this to user data, just like that. It's going to give us a little warning not to actually put the underscores by ourselves. This sort of macro group is going to add the underscores in all the places that it needs. So all you need to do is type data. You don't need to do anything else. So now I've made a few changes to this. Let's go back to Pro Tools and sort of run it one more time. So again, I'm going to start with a basic file name that really has no information in it. I'm going to open the dialog box. And this time when I run the macro group, you'll see that I'm not going to get a warning because we've disabled that block. It's not going to tell us each time I push F16 that I'm going to get this huge text across the screen. So again, I'm going to start to type a uh, category. I'm going to type boat. I want to see what kind of boat categories I have. And I see, okay, I want to sign a uh, rowboat. So I'm going to click enter. And again, it's now gonna ask me for a user category. I'm gonna skip this again. I don't really need to define one. And I'm gonna skip the vendor category as well. Now it's gonna ask me for the effects name and I'm gonna put rowboat slow or movement. Okay, when I hit enter this time, you see it's now prompting me for the creator ID. So it's changed the name to creator ID. And again, it hasn't entered a search term by default for me. I'm gonna to have to type something. So I can again type custom if I wanted to. Again, I could type my name or I could type Kai's name. Oops, let me spell it. But I'm gonna to have to put something here because again, this is a required block in the file name. So I can't just simply skip this. Basically, if I hit return, basically it goes, hey, you gotta pick something, that's the rules. So again, I'll put my name. And again, now you see it's prompting me for the source ID. So we've renamed this again to match the file name structure. And now basically I can type the name of a show or again, I could type none. In this case, let's say it wasn't recorded for a particular show, I can just type none. And again, here it's now prompting us for the user data and it's reminding us don't add a prepending underscore. It's going to do that for us. And again, if I just leave this blank, then it won't actually prepend anything. It won't actually add the underscore or anything. It'll simply skip that. So again, I hit return. And basically, there it is. There's a much shorter name. This is basically a basic UCS file name, right? Robot slow or movement, TN, none. So that's just a quick example of two of the tools that exist now. We'll be adding some minor tweaks to them, squashing a couple little bugs over the next couple of days, but they're technically available now. There are some video tutorials in the folder itself with the tool that Kai has sort of come up with to explain it. Uh, similarly to what I've done here, you're welcome to download them and start to play with them. And again, as new tools pop up, we'll be adding them here to this channel, so please subscribe. So in the next video, we'll look at SoundMiner and we'll see the power of a fully structured file name and the category ID system and what you can do in a program, a databasing program like SoundMiner. We'll see how the program has the ability to break the file name apart, assign metadata to various fields, and things like that. And I think then the power of a system like this will really become apparent.